Okay, ACPE, welcome to uh, April, April Mardock session on a guide to the NIST cybersecurity framework with a K-12 perspective. Uh, April is the CISO and operations manager for Seattle Public Schools. Uh, just a few quick logistics for you. Uh, ask all of your questions in the chat and we will address those at the end of the session. Uh, and then I'll see you on the uh, back end uh, to go through the questions and uh, closing statements. So April, it's all yours. Thank you much. So again, I'm April Murdoch. I'm um, a CISSP and I work for Seattle Public Schools as their cybersecurity manager and operations manager. I've got about 18 engineers working for me in different roles um, from data center, networks, cybersecurity, all of that stuff. But I've, as most of you are probably aware, I've got a pretty big passion about cybersecurity and cybersecurity in K-12 specifically. And when I was looking for ways to try to help both my team and my users, um, the NIST cybersecurity framework, the CSF, became kind of my point of reference. It's straightforward and it's really pretty easy to tell the story of what the work is that we need to do to make our cybersecurity footprints safer. And so with that, um, I wanted to take that framework and maybe look at some specific ways we could apply it in the K-12 space. And it was originally intended kind of for, for lower maturity orgs and smaller orgs. And I think a lot of us in the K-12 space never have enough resources in that cybersecurity space, whether it's we don't have enough staff, we don't have enough budget, we don't have what we need to really make cybersecurity happen in the way that we want to. So all of us are sort of starved for the resources um, to make that work, and so my question became, how do I focus those resources on those things that make the biggest impact? And this uh, NIST cybersecurity framework helped me with that. It, it walks you through five basic steps that you can see here. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and promote the slide here. Um, actually, I'll back up. Uh, identify, which is basically looking for all of the things that you wanna protect. Protect, um, which is uh, the safeguards that are available. Um, detect, so you've identified what it is you wanna take care of you have um, protected in, in various different ways those things that you wanna protect. And then what you wanna figure out is detecting the attack as it occurs. So that's the detect stage, which is yellow here. And then responding to that, detecting it is not enough. You have to be able to stop the attack, do something about it. Um, yes, it is being recorded. Um, and then, after the response, you then move to restoration. So given those pieces, um, the cybersecurity framework basically gives you this really straightforward process for trying to identify all of the different pieces of your cybersecurity landscape. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, right? So with those pieces, how does that really calculate across into the K-12 space? And so I broke it into pieces um, and said, okay, those are the four, the, the basic functions, right? Identify what I have, protect it with whatever resources I can, detect the attacks, respond to the attacks. And each of those, I'm gonna have strengths and weaknesses, right? I'm gonna have things I do well and things I don't do well. And by the way, if you want help figuring that out, I'm running a session later with a cybersecurity assessment that will help you figure that out if you don't already know. But within that context of where I'm doing well and not doing well as an organization, there are maturity models. The NIST CSF 1.1 actually identifies tier one, tier two, tier three, and tier four models. And the example that I use here is, let's say it's vendor management. All of us have vendors that we allow into our systems in one way or another. And, and maybe some of you are really successful at making this not happen, but most of us get forced into letting vendors have accounts of some sort. And maybe we have a list of accounts at a basic tier one level. We know which accounts we've created. The tier two, higher maturity level, might be I have those accounts and I've got expiration dates recorded in that Excel spreadsheet. And when that date rolls around, I might even have a, a calendar event that says, go turn off this vendor's account because the contract's up. 
a tier three district wouldn't be doing it manually anymore. Tier three district would probably automate so that that account automatically expires when it's supposed to go away. There's no manual intervention involved. And a tier four district would actually be in live communication, what they call adaptive communication with the vendor and say, share threats, things that they've seen. The vendor tells them when there's been an exploit, says, hey, suspend our accounts. We've got some problems. Seattle schools had that issue uh, when, with Versatrans. Um, that vendor had some pretty serious issues and worked with us to make sure that their access was suspended during the period that they were figuring out what was affected and what wasn't. And so we had sort of a back and forth conversation rather than waiting for the piece of paper from the vendor that says, we've been owned, we're sorry, and here's some supports to, and numbers to call. That's way too late in the process to deal with the problem. So moving to that adaptive place is sort of the long-term target. But let me back up and say, most of us aren't there yet. I'm not there yet. And I've got a lot more resources than some of the smaller districts. So let's look at identify. Let's start at the top. And in the identify space, what we want to do is identify those assets, both physical access, software assets that we want to, to protect. It's really hard to protect what you don't know about. So you have to pause and create that inventory. And that inventory is also going to be tied to your governance and your risk management. So let me talk about risk management for a minute. In the managing risk space, the thing that I use to wait where I put my energies, my resources, and my time is what I call the worry index. And the worry index is taking the impact of what could happen, let's say ransomware, could stop school, make a mess, share data, against the probability of that actually happening. Is this April doing a chicken little, saying that the sky is falling when in fact the chances are one in 10,000 that it would actually happen? Is this a theoretical thing or is this real? Do my peers in Washington state and Oregon state actually experience this threat and it's going to likely happen to me? It's not really a matter of, of if but when, right? So what is, where does this, this thing I'm worried about fall in my risk, my, what I call the worry index? And it's those things at the top of the worry index that I want to spend my most resources on. You prioritize that list because you can't do it all. None of us can. So you figure out what those top 10 things are that you want to follow up on, and you do them. And um, a friend of mine actually recently said it's, it's like eating the elephant one bite at a time. So you prioritize the list, and you do it in incremental and manageable ways. Because otherwise, everybody's just going to throw up their hands and say, it's too overwhelming. Why do we bother? It's going to be bad no matter what we do. And I would disagree. If you make sure that you prioritize those highest worry index things and spend your resources on those things, hopefully you drastically reduce your risk footprint a bit. Identifying that risk and, and ranking that list of, of concerns allows you to identify both the why and the what. Why are you protecting this asset? Because of its impact, right? How, what, what do I want to spend my resources on? those things at the top of the list. So the other thing you might want to check into if you haven't already is if your district has identified a risk framework, that may also help you weigh the different things that you need to protect and figure out which one matters the most in the context of your enterprise risk framework. The other thing I would remind everybody is there's some low hanging fruit out there. There's some, and we'll talk about what those might be a little bit later in the session, but the bottom line is there are often some low cost, high payoff things that you can do today or tomorrow that would actually help your cybersecurity framework a bunch. And then of course, there's your vendors and managing your vendors. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. So the identify piece is your asset management, um, your environment, your governance structures, your policies that you may have in place. And so what I'm gonna do is step you through some other identify tasks. So, and I've bolded this and I'll make the PDF available later. Um, I'll follow up and figure out where I can do that so you can see these and follow up on them. But you wanna create a list of your equipment, your software and your data. Some tools can make that automatic, others maybe not so much, but you can at least make a list of those high priority items and at least start there. Make a list of your vendor accounts, 
Identify the roles and responsibilities of your um, employees and your vendors and anyone else who has access to the sensitive data. I'm not saying to do it to everything. That may be too much, but to the sensitive stuff. Um, and then what you can do is take a look. Have you done a vulnerability scan or had one of those done for you? Maybe take a look at that report and add that to the list of things and figure out where that falls in the weighted things that, that you need to deal with. Again, you don't have to do it all. What you're trying to do is create a list of, of potential targets and rate the ones you're most worried about. And then what we're going to talk about is sort of the, the disclosure risk. And so in the disclosure risk space, what I worry about is both the vendors and us as far as what kinds of things, what kind of controls do I need to have in place to make sure that sensitive student data is not exposed to the outside world. Um, and I have a, a number of different things in that, and we'll talk about some of those protection mechanisms. But the first step of protecting it is to identify that you have it, right? Um, and then managing uh, employee accounts, that can become an overwhelming task. We still don't have that solved. Um, it, it, it seems more complicated every time I look at it. Look at your board policies that may be able to support you. We have the internet access board policy, and we also have a data privacy policy that we use to help our efforts. And then, of course, in your list of equipment, you probably want to identify those things that are end of life and can't be patched or, or helped in the security space. So the next thing that we're going to move to after we've done the identification is protection. How can I make those things safer? Uh, and so there's all sorts of levels to this. There's how do I protect the confidentiality of that and keep people from getting to it that shouldn't? How do I protect the integrity of that information or that system so that it can't be modified? And then how do I make sure it stays up in this sort of disaster recovery context of making sure that it's available, that I've not locked it down so tight that it can't even be used, right? And then the next layer to that is what mechanisms can I use to protect it? Maybe I've got some options that aren't crazy expensive or crazy, crazy complicated. What options do I have in that space to protect my stuff, my people, my systems, my students, and even more broadly, you know, the staff and, and the whole architecture, the whole system. Uh, and then, of course, in protection is the human operating system, right? What can I do to help my employees, my staff, and even to some degree the students and the students' families better protect themselves and by so doing better protect the organization. <clears throat> so I have my favorite three and if any of you know me you know I harp on these on a pretty regular basis because I see them as relatively um, mm, easy or at least low-hanging fruit with a big payoff. And that is removing local administrator rights on devices. And I know some districts have tried this and failed and rolled it back. But the way that we did it in Seattle, I think um, might work for you too, which is we by default don't give anyone admin rights, but we do have an account. The password is changed by script and published every day, published to the technologists. And that username and that daily password that changes every day is handed over to whatever user desperately needs admin rights and can't live without it. They can do what they need to do, install that scanner printer thing, whatever it is that they need the admin rights for. And that account then it expires for them within 24 hours. And what that has done is it means by people get admin rights and yes, bad things can happen, but they don't have admin rights every day all the time. So the chances of them having admin rights at the moment an attack is in play, whether they're browsing the web or they're reading their email or they're doing something else, that's going to be less of a risk. And so you can use um, those mechanisms to control admin rights. That's one of my favorite controls. Just stop giving people admin rights. On a related note, if you've done that already and your maturity level is higher, the next step on that maturity model is to do laps. I've, I see the comments there, which basically means if a, an administrator is, uh, account has been hacked and compromised on one machine, if you've used that same account on a whole bunch of other machines, that same username password combo, you're in trouble because the bad guys can take that 
and you can roll it and step on everything out there and and take over the organization is in, in all the places where that admin username and password are used, right? So you, using laps prevents the bad guy from once they take ownership of one machine, using that one password to affect others. So that's a, a next step in the maturity level. And that does take a little more work and we can talk about that later in the, in the chat. But for the rest of the districts, let's start with removing admin rights. Because if you don't remove admin rights, there's no point in managing admin passwords because the user already has them. Um, so that's my number one. It's fairly straightforward to do. It does create some pushback, but if you've got a mechanism to deal with the pushback, it works out. The next step in my top three protections is stop allowing downloaded Office macros to fire off. Um, I will automatically now allow a script to shut off a user and shut off a machine if it tries to fire a macro inside an Office document, a Word macro or an Excel macro that's been downloaded. I'm fine if the finance department wants to do their own macros. That's just fine. Um, but in that context, it's not an internet downloaded macro. It's one that they've written on their own. And so in that context, I'm okay with macros. What I wanna do is stop the ones that get downloaded and fired. And that you can do a bunch of different ways. You can do it with GPO and there's some other methods that you can do with the cloud controls but it's not a terribly difficult thing to do, it's not expensive to do, and it's fairly low on the disruption scale. And then the last one is, please, please, let everything automatically patch as much as you can. And for those of the bigger shops that have dev test and prod environments, at least allow your dev test environments to automatically patch and schedule your prod patches at least every 30 days. Um, we let as much as we can automatically update. Um, now, to be fair, we auto update, but we stagger it. So I have a group, I have 100 schools, and about 10 of them run the updates first, and we see how disruptive that is. And then we allow the rest of them to auto update a week or so later. Um, it's staggered, and it's staggered on purpose because I'm of the older generation that has had large numbers of machines bricked because we didn't do that a long time ago. So we learned you don't just mass deploy updates all the time everywhere, you stage them. But for your workstations, you can stage them for a small group of schools and then roll it everywhere else. And for your servers, you can stage them for, you can auto patch your dev and your test and your QA and then manage your prod directly. But please don't let prod slide indefinitely. Those are often your most exposed, highest risk servers. So if you're doing that risk management, you really gotta make sure that those machines stay patched too. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on because I'm gonna be low on time and we can pick some of the questions up. Other suggested um, protection um, tasks is, um, you know, think about the human operating system side. So get yourself a security policy so you can push back on some of the, the human choices. Along with that is training, right? Training is a form of protection. Uh, make sure that you've modified with your vendors. Vendors for me have become a risk. Some of my vendors have data that's really scary and their approaches are a little concerning. So now in my RFP template, I have encrypt our data at rest. It's in there, it's clear. I also have, you have to delete my data after our contract is done. It's spelled out in black and white. I have other controls of a similar mechanism that are buried in the RFP process so that they're held accountable to it and that they have to follow my rules. Um, or if you're leveraging the more general um, uh, uh, statewide DSA agreements, they're similar in terms of protection. But make sure that that's part of your purchase process so that you have some teeth in your relationship with your vendor. Uh, encrypt sensitive data. You've got to think about encryption at rest for your high value stuff like your grades and your payroll stuff and all of that kind of content. It's the newer um, databases allow you to encrypt by default um, as built into the OS. Um, and then of course, you'll hear about ransomware and offline copies. I also would suggest you think about immutable backups, which are backups that you can't delete or change, that they're out there and they can't be messed with so that you have something you can fall back to. Um, have made, um, remember that a printer 
and a copier often have a drive on them and the content of that drive unless it's encrypted may have data that is not something you want shared so make sure you manage disposal of fax machines and printers and copiers and that sort of thing um, also partition break your networks into smaller pieces so that if one gets compromised it's harder for the bad actor to move to other parts of the network it's not just automatically visible and available uh, make sure you turn on the malware protections you have. I actually ran for quite a while with, we had iBoss as a web filter, a web content filter. And there's some malware controls in that that we didn't turn on, partly because we were nervous about what it might do. But we really should have, because the more vendors in the loop, the more likely if vendor A misses something, vendor B might get it. We call it defense in depth, right? But turn on those controls. Um, you can always turn them back if they don't work, but I strongly suggest that you leverage the tools that you have um, that will make a huge difference. And Defender, by the way, is amazing. Um, I've been quite happy with things that it's been able to stop and alert us to. Um, limit the use of enterprise admin. So this did not make me popular on my own team. I said no more browsing the web using your, your domain admin or enterprise admin accounts. Number one, if you're using an Office, uh, uh, an Office 365 enterprise admin account, you're not gonna have that role until you activate it and it will deactivate it in four or six or eight hours. It will not stay live all the time, that's part one. Part two, you're not gonna browse the web, read your email and do all that daily stuff using a domain admin level account, right? You wanna use a normal account with normal rights so if something happens to your machine, it gets stuck. The reason I push so hard on this is you don't have to go to a bad website and click a link or open a bad attachment and do stupid things, I, I stay stupid in quotes, to get infected. You can now be infected with certain kinds of zero days without clicking anything. You can drive by a site. We got infected uh, this is a couple years back, the Seattle Times had compromised advertisements. The advertisements fired off Flash, and I know Flash is bad and we shouldn't have had it deployed, but we got infected and nobody clicked anything. They simply went to the Seattle Times website and their machine was infected. So we learned at that point that you don't necessarily have to click anything to get attacked. So the best defense is to not have admin rights at that point, right? Minimize the, the risk. And then using, we talked uh, earlier about LAPS and the ability to make different admin passwords. So if a machine is compromised, that the admin password on that machine cannot be used to compromise other machines. And then of course, training. And then I do suggest you consider blocking international access for your staff. Most of your staff are using, um, are working in your district, in your state, in your space. Remote access might be a little bit different, but in general, your staff don't need to go overseas. So turn off international access and create a group. If there's a group, is a, a staff that need to go overseas, put them in that group and give them rights, but you don't have to give it to everybody by default. Okay, now let's talk about, we've done the protection work. Let's move to detect, okay? So in the detection space, the attack is now happening and we need to see it right? We want to identify that a bad thing is happening right now. And in that space, we've got monitoring, right? We want to know anomalies. So to see an anomaly, you need to know what normal looks like, just a hint. And then to make sure that what we're doing is actually protecting. Uh, so here are my top three detect tasks. Number one, most of us in school districts work daytime hours. We don't work at night. Who's watching the shop at nights and on weekends? The bad guys are intentionally attacking us on weekends and holidays. They're intentionally trying to create that disruption in a space where we're not watching. So how are you dealing with that? You're either gonna need to automate things so that if an attack happens, it gets shut down, or you're gonna need a managed service provider in the security space that can do it on your behalf. But somehow you need to deal with escalation after hours. All of us sleep. I've got texts up until midnight and I have texts that get up at like four or five in the morning, but there's always a window at night where I don't have anybody watching the shop. And so my managed service provider does. 
And so we pay them to make sure that they do that. And they've got some pretty awesome deals for K-12. I, I think they've, I've made them feel sorry for me. I hope they'll, they'll reach out and provide the same opportunity to others. Benchmarking. If you don't know what your internet traffic looks like, if you don't know what the normal traffic to a sensitive server like a, a sys server looks like, if you don't know what normal traffic looks like, it's really hard to recognize hostile traffic or unusual traffic. So make sure you make a habit of having your engineers look at that and get a sense for what normal is so that they're more likely to be able to um, recognize when something is not. Um, and then for the window shops, I admit I'm, I'm not a Chromebook shop. I'm not a Google shop. I am Microsoft biased, but Windows Defect Defender is amazing. It has the ability to stop things. We've had ransomware land at Seattle schools, but Defender has been able to warn us and we've been able to do remote isolation, even in this current remote work, right? I can reach out across the network across the cloud across, into somebody's home and turn off that district device and basically say, thou shalt not do anything with that device at this point. I can do that with Defender um, and I can, I have two controls, right? I have the ability to isolate the device and then of course I can isolate the account. Um, not so much with Defender, but with the cloud controls that go with it or I can disable the account. Um, and if some of you wanna ping me later, I have a whole checklist of things to do when you're isolating um, or um, expiring a user account of a rogue user, because you wanna to remember to revoke the tokens so that can't still be used. You wanna make sure that you disable the, the inbox rules. There's things like that that you might wanna make sure you do as you um, deal with threats. So just make sure that whatever mechanism you use, we'll talk about the tuning piece that's also important, right? It doesn't do any good to have a detection if nobody's watching. So moving to other detection tasks, there's activating your data loss protection tools. So the data loss protection piece also often comes with say Office 365 and you can say, if you see a student ID number leaving or a social security number leaving the district, you can actually flag it and get an email about that match. Um, and we've done a little bit of that uh, to make sure that we know when social security numbers, for instance, leave the district uh, by, via email or Office 365 shares. Um, make sure that you are intentionally investigating those alerts and make sure that you review those alarms on a regular basis. Alert fatigue is a thing. Um, and so you're gonna wanna spend that time, and it's not a huge amount of time, but you do need to spend time to make sure that you're not getting so many alerts that you've just stopped watching. Because there's really no point in the detection at that point, because you're not gonna catch it. Um, I do have a little script that tells me when somebody gets added to my global admin, my enterprise admin, domain admin, any of those specialized accounts, account operators, another one of those that's kind of scary, and it will let me know when somebody's added to those special groups. And that way I have a better handle on, ooh, looks like there's a privilege escalation or somebody's actually got enough ownership of AD to put somebody in a scary group. And those, I don't get those very often. And when I do, I pay attention. And that's the thing I have to work on is it's great to have all the information. I love Greylog. It's where I collect almost everything. But I can't, I can't watch it all. I just can't. So I have to tune it down to the level that I will actually watch the alert. If you're not gonna watch the alert, don't turn it on. I mean, I guess you could log it so you have it forensically to go back and look at it later, but there's no point in sending yourself uh, an SOS if you're not gonna look at the SOS, right? Log it, you'll appreciate having the logs later, but you've gotta find a way to manage it so that you look at the alert you're getting and your team has the opportunity to do so. So let's move to respond. In the response section of this, we're talking about making sure that we actually not just detect it, but we stop the attack, right? And in that space, we have to manage the communications, we have to manage the activities, we have to make sure that we actually were successful at stopping that attack. So in the response space, we're talking about what we do, who we talk to about it, 
the analysis work that we're doing, what mitigations we have in place, and then keeping a note on the side of things that maybe we might want to do better next time. So my top three response tasks are these. Make sure you, if you can, automate your isolation responses. Because again, if nobody is watching the shop at night, go ahead and let it suspend that workstation. I may not let it suspend a server, that's, that's a little scarier, but may, allow it to suspend a workstation. You can wait until morning to, to flip that back on if it was a false positive. But you really need to be proactive about stopping the bad actors before they have all night to spread across your network or all weekend. Um, so take advantage of that where you can. Um, and there's some really cool tools, uh, even built into Office 365. Now, to be fair, you have to have an A3 license plus security to get some of these features where it's an automated response. But think about it. It, it, will, it will definitely help your team um, stop uh, bad actors before they get too far. Um, and you might find it's cost effective. Um, document everything that you're doing during the response. You need to extract every log you can and record every action you've taken because later you're going to need it both in the forensics, what happened, what might be done better next time. Maybe you'll need it for a report to the board or to your cybersecurity insurance for folks or to your um, service provider that's going to help you with the, the issue, but you're going to want those logs. So part of response is taking notes, date, time, action date, time, action, as well as grab those logs because they could get purged, they may roll off by the time you realize them. I've got some logs that are only good for 30 days. I've got a couple logs, my controller logs roll in three days if I don't, if that particular event hasn't been tagged for gray log. And then again, alert fatigue. So you can't respond if you're not watching the alert. So you're gonna have to invest some time in that space to kind of tune down the false positives. And what I've done is I kind of go in the reverse. I grab a couple of very specific events that I freak out about. If I see a machine scanning other machines, I'm gonna insta lock it and it's gonna go into my SOS alert, right? I don't want any more than 10 SOS alerts in my space um, because I'm not gonna look at it if I get barraged every day. And I don't, it's a hard balance to find. Your managed service providers can help you here. There are some tools out there to help you, but I don't want people to get buried in the logs and the alerts to the point where they're not looking anymore because then we've sort of defeated the purpose. The next piece is talking about other respond tasks. So make sure that you don't forget to notify your, your employees and others who may be at risk. Um, it could be families, it could be uh, families of students, it might be vendors, um, especially if you've got VPNs with vendors, you might want to reach out in that space. Make sure that you're um, trying to sync up your cybersecurity efforts with your business continuity plans, your risk management plans, your incident response plans. Um, and one of the things that we learned when we were talking to our folks was, what if we're at a full stop? What if all the systems are offline? What do you wish you'd extracted to a PDF and put up in the cloud somewhere, not necessarily even in our domain, but, but with protections? What do you wish you'd extracted? Is it a guardian list? Is it kid home addresses? Is it the, in this case, we, we had a discussion about the buses and what their schedules were and where they were going. Um, other things that we, they wanted to extract were like the building floor plans, if we'd had like an earthquake. What is it you want to squirrel away and put in a, almost a, what you would put in a paper binder? What PDFs do you need to stash away that you can use to keep the business functional enough while you're working on recovery? Cyber recovery, earthquake recovery, whatever the recovery is, what did you need to squirrel away to keep your org functional and your kids safe? What does that look like? Uh, the schools were talking about, well, they need the guardian list so they can reunite kids with parents, right? So what is that? What does that look like? Uh, and then, of course, reporting. You need to know what your reporting requirements are, uh, re reporting to law enforcement, the state, other authorities. You need to obviously try to contain the attack. Um, and I would actually practice with your teams on different mechanisms for controlling spread, right? Where can they break the network into smaller pieces? What can they shut down? At what layers can they shut it down in the OSI model? 
Um, you know, they're shutting down switches, they're shutting down VLANs, they're shutting down routing. How do you quickly shut the internet down? Um, all of those kinds of things should be talked about in advance, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens. Um, and then, of course, file it, file with your insurance provider in the response space, right? You got to tell them what's going on. Some of them will basically say, you need to tell us immediately. The moment you think this is a big event, you have to invoke us so we can send our professionals in to minimize damage. We've got practice and we're going to help you, but you have to tell us that this is going on. So, and there are other folks here that have probably been in that space too. And of course, uh, proactively managing communications. You, you have to make sure that you are intentional about managing your communications with the press, your communications team, your own staff, the parents, um, the community, all of that needs to be managed in an intentional way. So moving to the recovery function. So we're talking about restoring service. And the recovery function for the NIST CSF is making sure that you've basically set up the controls to do your lessons learned, um, making sure that you've got the pieces in place to kind of make yourself successful after the fact. What did you learn? How can you make this better? So the recovery pieces are recovery planning, improvements, and communications. And here's my recover tasks for you. One is to test and update your recovery plans whatever those look like and you know it's an old maxim but to fail to plan is to plan to fail right you need to be intentional about putting these plans together and then testing the plan as best you can um that and as a side note i'm sneaking in here please test your backups because it's really hard to restore from a broken backup so you want to test all of those layers of the plan as best you can now there may be some things you can't do but at least talk them through Incident response plan. By the way, you probably want an offline copy. Some of these attacks are gonna take your whole domain down, your Office 365 down, your systems and servers down. You're gonna need an offline copy, whether it's paper in the homes of the folks who, who are working this, or you've got another domain, a mechanism, but figure out how to get a copy of that incident response plan out um, that don't require them logging into the domain to get it. Also, what's in your incident response plan? When I audited mine, I realized I didn't have the FBI and law enforcement contacts on it. I didn't have my cyber insurance contact on it. I didn't have the email address for the state CISO who's starting to ask us to do um, filing with them as well. Um, I did have my subject matter expert home phone numbers though. So what kinds of things need to be in that plan? Learn, talk it through, practice it, maybe even in a small event and then revise it and make it better. The other thing I learned in our last table talk exercise was I need to work with legal, and I need to work with legal and communications to come up with template responses for an, essentially all hazards. An emergency of some sort needs certain kinds of responses to go out. We're working the issue, we're working it through, but here's kind of a canned, Legal's already said it's okay. Comms has already said it's okay. Here's sort of a stage one release, stage two release, stage three release. Here's where we're going to publish it. Here's what it's going to say. It can be kind of templatized, but work with your legal teams in advance um, to get that through. And use that table talk session with legal and cabinet to help. And, and the easiest one I can think of is to walk through a ransomware incident, right? Step them through a ransomware incident all the way through the process from not just the technical piece, but through the communications piece, the iteration piece, the press piece, the escalations, help them think it through so that this is not a surprise and you Am I there? <laughs> Hello? Yep, okay. That was, it, uh, it ate my presentation, but we're pretty close to done. Let me pull this back up real quick. Um, that was strange. Um, yes, I do have a backup plan. <laughs> it's all good. Preview slides, let's see if I can get this back. 
We'll go to the end. I think we're there. Nope. Uh, da, 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 da. Almost. There we go. Other recovery tasks. So everybody seeing this okay? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Cool. So we talked about updating lessons learned. Make sure that you've updated your templates. Um, make sure that you've, you've figured out what methods you're going to use to communicate with folks as far as social media, website, phone trees, et cetera. Working this out in advance will save you a whole lot of heartache when events happen, and they will. Um, and then, of course, um, the other thing that I found kind of interesting in this whole table talk exercise is we couldn't agree. When my team are working an issue and there's a big deal going on, I need some place I can post the status update and send everybody over there so they stop bugging us. What's the agreed upon way to post status updates? Maybe a technical update and a, and a policy update, I'd, whatever works for your district. But you need to agree on where everybody goes for the truth. And that's where you post your stuff and then you get back to the work at hand. In a perfect world, I would have already had like a, a public relations liaison fronting my technology team folks so that we can stay on the work and they can do the interfacing for all of the, the communications and stuff that comes up as a, as a result. So to review NIST cybersecurity framework, it's fairly straightforward. You've got identify things, protecting, detecting, responding, um, and then of course the, the lessons learned and, and reboot, right? What is it, what are your, identifying what you need to protect, what safeguards can you find to put in place, how can you identify an incident is actively happening, what are you gonna do when you find out an incident is actively happening, and then what are you gonna learn from that and apply for next time? Um, and then these are some resources that can be helpful. Uh, there, remember that the Department of Education had a group called PTAC, and they've published a whole bunch of helpful information in this space. Here's one of the links here, their security best practices. They have all kinds of templates and really useful K-12 specific references that I found amazing. Um, there's also NIST. The, you can send questions to the cyber framework folks at NIST.gov. You can send questions to me, and I'm wearing my volunteer k126.org hat here, but k126 is sort of taking that whole idea of sharing this information and running with it, and, and they're willing to listen to me when I'm saying, maybe we ought to share these disable scripts, maybe we ought to work together on, instead of my district inventing it and keeping it to myself, all of the big districts are doing this work. What if we shared it with all the little districts? And the little districts who have really smart people can share with us. And maybe together we can do this cheaper and with less effort and, and better. What a concept. So I'm kind of excited about what K-12-6 is doing in that space. They actually even have a CISO that you, if you join K-12-6, they have a CISO that, that has office hours that you can go and consult with and ask questions in the space. And then the last bit is, um, suggestions, which is please think about joining an information sharing group, something like K-12-6 or MSISAC or InfraGuard. Find a place where you can share your issues in a safe place because it's a lot easier to fess up to an issue and find ways to solve it that aren't going to create a penalty or a problem, right? OPSEC EDU, you bet. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of that group for sharing information back and forth too. Um, asking your peers, um, ACPE Discord, wonderful place to share information and learn and grow and challenge each other and give each other links and helps. Um, OPSEC EDU, there's some people all over the U.S. that, that uh, collaborate together in that space. And then the K-12-6 portal, um, where you can actually even upload stuff and say, wow, look at this attack. I just posted one that was, they copied our website. And they sent this email that was really uh, our colors and our signatures, and 400 people got it, and half of them clicked on it. It was pretty scary. And I thought, well, maybe I should tell other districts. And sure enough, when I posted it and other districts saw it, they checked their stuff, and they'd been attacked too. So um, ISAC's in the, in the same sort of space. So please take advantage of these shared resources 
um, to learn and help each other. Because I think together, we can make a difference. We really can. So with that, I'll take questions. Uh, I'm happy to share my presentation. I'm just not sure, sure where. It's a PDF. And um, please, the more the merrier. All right, April. Uh, great job as usual. Thank you so much for sharing a lot of your expertise and knowledge with us. Uh, I know it takes a lot of time to uh, gather all that uh, knowledge and implement it into a program. So uh, we appreciate that. So one of the first questions that came up was from John Simmons. Uh, when you were talk talking about local admin rights, apparently they are probably in a Azure environment uh, as far as Azure AD managed devices and wanted to know your input on how do you manage local admin privileges in that environment? Um, well, you can create a PowerShell script to go out, change the password and change it back. Um, there's a couple technical mechanisms. I'm sure other folks on this this call may actually have ideas in that space on how to, I mean, the device is still connected and you still have control of it and you still have the ability to manage it. Um, it would be an interesting question as to, I mean, you don't want the user to have admin rights regardless, right? So the question is, how do you bridge the user into a place where they can do their special thing that is demanding admin rights temporarily and then revoke those rights again. So I, I guess it would be a, a question of the environment. And I don't know that I have a clear answer to that, but the goal is the same. And somebody did post a resource of a, looked like a blog article or something, uh, referencing a product or process. Thank you. Uh, Tyler Skar Starkovich, are you using CISA cyber cybersecurity assessments? Um, no, not right now. Um, we're using a, um, a fairly simplified CSF based assessment. Um, but that will probably be something now that I have another person on my cybersecurity team where I can share the work. Um, I might have him sanity check the stuff that we've done already with the CISA tools. I like the depth of their materials. All right, and from Nathan Swinson asked about Office 365 add-ins to Office that include their own macros. How do you handle that? Ooh, um, I set the GPO, which sets the registry that says don't download internet-enabled macros. If it sidesteps that, that registry entry, um, there are several ways you can set, oh, oh, I'm sorry, there is another registry entry to do that. Um, I actually have a, um, I'll post it later. I have a blog entry on um, how to disable macros. And there's two mechanisms. One is sort of the GPO base that sets the kind of on-prem office word and Excel blocks. But there's another one that does the same thing in the Office 365 environment. I wonder if that would work. Um, maybe those who, who play in that space a little bit more would know. But you can set that registry and essentially either be um, cloud facing or local application facing. And I'm hoping that if both of those are set, maybe that won't work, but I need to look at that because that sounds scary. <laughs> All right, and from Tony Silver, uh, regarding the Sentinel SIM, what other services or logs do you ingest outside of the 365 logs? Uh, they have A5 plus Defender ATP and are looking to add a SIM and could use suggestions on next steps. Uh, so I cheat. I don't, I don't want to pay the bill for Sentinel to eat all that traffic. And so I have Greylog on-prem and I collect it all to Greylog. I, Sentinel doesn't own it all yet. I'm looking at expanding that, but I haven't yet. Um, now that said, there are some, some, yeah, I don't have a good answer other than I, I don't want to pay that bill. And I don't know if Nathan is in the audience uh, or not, uh, but uh, we have Sentinel stood up in Salem Kaiser uh, and just ingesting all the free logs. And I don't remember what they are. Uh, pretty much anything in the Microsoft cloud is mostly yeah. free. Yeah. Uh, the storage, I think we pay like a buck 50 a month. Oh, uh, nice. Well, not for the Office 365 stuff, but when we started pointing the firewall at it, that oh, yeah. volume got big fast. <laughs> so yes, the mostly free is nice for the uh, the Microsoft specific stuff. Um, but I, I am starting to like Sentinel a lot more. There's so many more controls now, automatic responses. It's it's seeing sort of the, the threat 
um, in a deeper way, um, I, I think it's going to save me some some incidents. Um, so yeah. And a saw a raise hand, but I don't see it now. Uh, so Jesse asked, "Are you currently subscribed to ISAC?" Yes, absolutely. The problem with ISAC that I found is some of the information isn't executable for me. The block for the domains and the block for the IPs, ATP in many cases is already blocking those threats. It's really the more nuanced, how does this apply in my environment that I have to figure out? And that, that takes work. But I am kind of excited because if all of us participated with something like MSI SAC or K126 and uploaded our incidents and shared our lessons learned um, and our solutions, right? It's a bit of both. Um, I think we'd all save time in the end. All right. And that's all the, the questions that we have. I want to uh, also uh, share out that if you're not involved in the OPSEC EDU uh, Slack channel and you're in cybersecurity in K-12, you absolutely need to uh, be involved in that. Uh, I see Jared posted that you rock April. This was awesome. The practical tips and the real world application is wonderful. I agree. Um, so any other questions? We, we have April for the next 24 minutes. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'll do what I can to get this posted in a place where everybody has access. Um, and then uh, please, if you have feedback for next time, uh, let me know as well. As, uh, I'm always looking for opportunities to improve. So I suspect I may be doing this again. Yeah, and I'm sure ACPE, uh, once we get a, a moment to talk about it, we'll figure out how to contact the speakers to gather all the presentation slides. Uh, so with that, a uh, few logistics. We're moving into sponsor connection time. Uh, remember, if we want to put on a conference next year, we need to make our sponsors happy this year. So uh, spend the next hour uh, visiting the sponsor tables, and you can see those at the top of the Air Meets platform uh, where you see booths. Uh, so go visit all the sponsors, spend some time, sit down at a table and engage. Uh, we also have the think tanks. To get to the think tanks, you want to jump into the lounge uh, also at the top of the uh, Air Meets platform. So just walk in, sit at a table and join in conversations. And then finally, we have our social events tonight. If you did not sign up, that's okay. Uh, we do have the sessions posted in the Discord uh, channel for social events. So if you hop into the ACPE Discord, into the social events channel, you can see all the Zoom links to all the social events happening tonight. So you can join even if you didn't sign up. Uh, you can bring your own booze, your own steaks or whatever, depending on which you, uh, which event you hop into and uh, enjoy the fun. So April, once again, thank you so much for sharing your hard earned knowledge uh, with, with all of us. And with that, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you all. Much appreciate.